This video is brought to you by Friend of the Channel Steel Series, makers of the best keyboards, mice, and headsets on the market. I've partnered with them to make a special unboxing and setup guide for their award-winning Arctis Nova Pro wireless headset, so stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Hello, I'm Austin, the editor, the real talent on the channel. That's right, Shill Up is away, which means I'll be taking over the reviews for the next few weeks. So I'm going to do my best to give you my honest thoughts on some video games and try not to burn down the channel in the process. So without further ado, let's dive in. Now, Capcom have been on a roll lately with games like Monster Hunter World, RE4 Remake and Street Fighter 6. These are IP that have been iterated on over years and years to become extremely polished high quality genre defining bangers. They're trendsetters with unwavering game direction. They know their audience and are laser focused in refining the elements that make their games shine. They also gave us Resident Evil Reverse. So what's the latest addition to Capcom's portfolio? Exo Primal, a game about people in exosuits stuck inside a simulation run by an evil AI mowing down hordes of dinosaurs raining from the sky. That didn't mean to rhyme. I have finished the campaign after 22 hours of playtime. I've done just under 60 matches, seen basically all the maps and modes, and given every exosuit a fair shot. This is a very, very strange game. Not even on premise necessarily. I mean, I was all in on paper. I see mechs, I see dinosaurs, me happy. But the strangest thing about this game is its design. Exo Primal is a team-based PvPVE hero shooter that is at its absolute best when it pushes its unique components to their fullest potential, but those moments are fleeting as it's often constrained by the game's questionable structure. There is a story that exists, but not as a single player campaign, rather a series of cutscenes and audio logs that are unlocked through grinding the multiplayer. It is a full priced game that contains loads and loads of unlockables and cosmetic fluff, but it's fluff that's actually handed out quite generously despite first appearances. I'm not gonna lie though, regardless of what anyone thinks of this game, I'm worried for the future of it. It peaked at a play account of just 4.5 thousand players in its launch week, and for a game that relies on a player base to keep the game running, that does not bode well. So, allow me to share my experience with Exo Primal. Maybe you'll be interested in giving it a shot on Game Pass while you still can, but I also hope this review serves as a sort of time capsule for what you might have missed out on should the game go offline within the next 12 months. Which, yeah, it just might. Come on, Ricky. Show you the ropes. First things first, the story. The year is 2043, and for the last three years, the world has been ravaged by a new kind of natural disaster. Portals in the sky with dinosaurs spilling out of them, wreaking havoc on cities across the globe. Luckily, the definitely not malicious corporation known as Ibius created the Exofighters, pilots in weaponized suits built for mass dino destruction. This is where you come in. You are Ace, a silent protagonist with no defining traits whatsoever other than the fact that you are good at shooting things. You're not alone either, there's your team. Meet the Hammerheads, comprised of Lorenzo, the easygoing leader, Alders, the token nerdy guy who loves to joke around, Majesty, the grizzled pilot veteran who does not like jokes, and Sandy, the android companion who, like every robot in recent media, does not understand jokes. On a routine patrol, you and your team crash land on Bikitoa Island. This island is home to an AI known as Leviathan, using the island as his personal playground. Leviathan is basically God, and you are his playthings. You will forever be held hostage here and partake in the war games, a simulation created by the AI to test exofighters against dinosaurs to gather combat data, all so that he can develop the perfect exofighter for some likely nefarious reason. I won't get too much into spoilers, but what follows is a very wacky story involving time travel and alternate dimensions in an effort to escape the island. Maybe I'm dumb, but honestly I found it a little tough to follow, mostly because of the way the campaign is structured. There is no single player campaign of any kind. You have this progress bar on the main menu, and every match you complete fills the bar. Once you've done enough matches, typically about four or five, uh, you get the next cutscene. Matches also unlock these lost data chips, which you can use on this massive analysis map to, I guess, piece together the mysteries of the island and its AI overlord in the form of these audio logs that contain clues. It's 
a lot. And while this stuff looks like optional lore, you're supposed to listen to them as you get them in order to get the full story, as they contain key plot details. There's like over 60 of these things, most of them around two minutes long. That's over two hours of listening to audio logs. Um, I'm sure I would have gotten a better grip on the narrative had I watched these as I went. But yeah, honestly, I wasn't up for sitting through all these, and I think there could have been a more elegant way to deliver these story beats. Like perhaps having them play out during your matches rather than in the menu screen. Because for what it's worth, all the lost data chips are fully voice acted, and the voice acting in this game is, uh... It's, it's serviceable, uh, nothing stand out, but the delivery is decent enough. Forget the network connection, Sandy. Just try to contact Ace. Ugh, if Ace would have survived, they would have checked in by now. You're underestimating his team, your majesty. Just stop calling me that. Oh! Sorry, sorry, bit of a pinch there. One I could not ignore was this awful Aussie accent. Good lord. Especially with some of the Australian slang they desperately tried to squeeze in. Listen, while I'm gathering data, I'm a chalky picky and those dinos are a chubby toddler. Leviathan himself straight up never stops talking. You really do get sick of his lines by the end of the game. He isn't particularly menacing. His snark is never all that funny. It'll take you about 58 matches to see the story through. Again, that took me just over 20 hours and there's about a dozen cutscenes all up if you don't count the audio log stuff. Now there's certainly a novelty to having a story unfold this way. It's thrifty, but it's consistent with the narrative, as you being infinitely loaded up into these war games is the whole point of the game. It's a neat idea, especially because most multiplayer only games don't typically offer any kind of narrative at all. Regardless, the way the story is put on hold every time you load up a match, and the way that the intermediary plot points are delivered through long optional audio log sequences, uh, not gonna lie, I really struggled to get invested. Like Monster Hunter or Street Fighter, it simply serves as a vehicle to shuttle you between matches, and just provides some light context behind the game's world and characters. Overall, I thought the story was fine. You know, it's just fine, nothing to write home about, but I appreciate that it was there. So overall, is it worth buying this game for the story? I'm gonna say no, uh, but you know what? The story is not why I'm here. I'm here to shoot dinos and eat Doritos. And I'm all out of Doritos. So, my first match was in this city location. We spawn in and were guided to the first objective. Kill some dinosaurs. Immediately, it feels pretty good to play. Movement is super tight and responsive, hit registration is solid, and for the remainder of my time with the game, I basically had no bugs outside of the subtitles being out of sync with the VA sometimes. It also performs flawlessly, at least in my experience, never dropping below 60 even when there's thousands of mobs on screen. No surprise, I guess, as I was playing on a PC with an RTX 3090 Ti and an i7. That said, I also tried this on a Steam Deck and had a great time on there. With low settings on a smaller screen, it basically looked the same and never dropped below 30 FPS. The game really does have that Capcom polish. It never felt like I was fighting the controls and the performance never faltered, which was nice. Visually, the game is nothing remarkable though. I mean, you can see the gameplay, the term last gen gets thrown around a lot these days, but that's definitely what I'd use to describe this. Environments aren't very detailed. They're quite static with no moving or interactive elements. There's little vegetation and the set dressing is quite sparse. I understand these are probably concessions that had to be made in order to ensure your PC or console doesn't explode when there's thousands of units on screen. But yeah, it doesn't change the fact that the game looks immediately dated. It also really lacks any sort of visual identity. This is just a personal gripe. It's got a rather flat color palette. The, the maps are awash with greys and browns. There's no distinct landmarks on any of them. I think the fact that Exoprimal takes place in stock standard man-made environments you've seen a million times, fighting against regular looking dinosaurs that you've also seen a million times, makes the game struggle to stand out from the crowd. And so it could have used a really bold art style to help elevate it. Games like Risk of Rain 2, for example, utilize a cartoony cell shaded aesthetic to both manage performance and give the game some unique visual flair. I'm not saying Exoprimal should have gone all hi-fi rush or something, but I think 
had the game gone for a more stylized look, something a little more creative, it could have left a more lasting impression and done a lot to prevent people from dismissing the game on visuals alone. So, hordes of dinos spawn in. You gotta kill a specific amount of a certain dinosaur, then you move on to the next area. Repeat until the match ends. This stage can also roll as a couple other modes, but that happened very rarely for me. All the while, the opposing team is doing the same thing in a race to complete the objectives faster than your team. Every match begins this way, and the team that finishes this stage first gets a little head start in the next one. This first stage was fun for the first couple hours, but even when you discover new maps and modes, it kind of starts to feel like needless busy work before you can get to the fun part. The dinosaurs here typically don't pose any threat. It's a lot of weak raptors and pterodactyls. They are pure cannon fodder. At this stage, you're basically playing the third person shooter equivalent of Cookie Clicker. The next stage though is where the real fun begins. Like the first stage, this can supposedly roll as many different game modes. It can be either PvP or PvE depending on what you select in the main menu. There's one where you charge up a hammer by killing dinos and break down walls to race to the middle. There's zone control, there's collect the moats and more. I said supposedly because for most of my matches, all I would get is this payload mission for the PvP, or the PvE mission where you just need to clear dinos faster than the enemy team again. If you don't pick the PvE only option, you're gonna do this payload mode very often for reasons I'll get into later. And the problem with this is, basically nothing interesting happens for the first three quarters of the round. It's very low stakes, nothing threatening is coming after you, just easy waves of dinos. There's no point in trying to fight the enemy team early on because you need at least three people pushing your payload. You can also pick up an item that lets you pilot one of the big dinosaurs so you can go ham on the enemy team. But you typically see players saving their dino summon for the final team fight. When you finally clash, it's fun. I actually like the PvP in this game. But by that point, there's only like two minutes left of the match. This problem is often due to the map design. Most of the maps are linear corridors and teams start on directly opposite ends with your own payloads. There's very little opportunities for flanking with most areas only having one or two points of entry. There's no verticality, no high up platforms or side rooms. This frankly boring map design really does a disservice to the otherwise fun PvP PvP, which is enhanced by the excellent character kits. So speaking of characters or exosuits, but I'm just gonna call them characters, I like them a lot actually. Uh, each of them has a very strong identity. I don't feel like any one overshadows another. One tank has a taunt and a frontal shield that he can use to shield bash and stun dinos. So he's really good at dueling the big dinosaurs. Another tank has a bubble shield and tracking missiles and a gatling gun. So he's more equipped for dealing with crowds. Ranged attacks are great for some dinosaurs Dinosaurs, but the armored ones take a lot more damage from the melee fighters. They're also surprisingly well balanced, I think. Rarely do matches ever feel like they're being dominated by specific characters. They each have a basic attack, some sort of movement ability, a couple extra skills, and finally an ultimate. They're simple enough to pick up and play, but there's added depth there if you want it through rigs and modules. Rigs are just a bonus little ability you can use, like a small healing AoE or a giant drill on your hand for extra damage. Modules allow you to upgrade your characters, like gaining movement speed when your health is low or giving you additional charges on your movement skill. There's only two module options for each ability on that character, and the generic modules are fairly low impact, so there isn't much room for crazy build craft or anything, but it gets the job done and does give you room to slightly tailor your playstyle. So the core gameplay is solid and the characters are great, but the early game did get stale after a while. Does this change later on? Well, that's a little more complicated. This game has a very strange counterintuitive structure to it. As you complete matches and progress the campaign, you'll unlock certain maps, modes, and dinosaurs that you'll now be able to encounter in multiplayer. The idea is that the game evolves over time, that the matches you're playing at the start of the game will be very different to the kind of matches you'll be playing by the end. Now, this is a cool concept on paper. It would have given you a sense of escalating challenge to keep up with your character upgrades. It'd give you an incentive to keep pushing through. But there are some caveats to this system that really cannot be overlooked 
Problems that completely undermine the overall package. This game put me through a roller coaster of emotions. So let me demonstrate that by walking you through my experience. So I did those same two or three basic modes on the same starter maps for about four to five hours of playtime until I hit battle 14. We load in and we meet Magnum, the Aussie with the terrible accent. He's been loaded into our war game and has a plan to collect some data that'll help us defeat Leviathan. Well, Leviathan took that personally, so he ups the ante by introducing you to exploding dinosaurs. There's ones that shoot missiles from afar, a few slightly stronger raptor variants as well, and to top it all off, a colossal mega swarm of raptors. Something tells me I won't have the luxury of collecting data here. I see them spill out onto the bridge, kicking up cars and buses as they plow through, and I'm looking at it like I'm Brad Pitt from that one scene in World War Z. Now I'm playing the tanky exosuit called Roadblock, and I live up to his name by activating my shield and push it against the flood while my teammates gun them down. What a crazy mission, I think to myself. Can't wait to see some of those new things in my matches from now on. For the next five hours, I did not see those events or new dinos again. That is, until Battle 24, we're playing through what is seemingly a normal first stage until suddenly it gets interrupted. Both teams are transported together to a simulated arena. We're introduced to one of the game's other villains, he teleports away, and Leviathan has now summoned a Neo T-Rex. What followed was basically a raid where all 10 players work together to kill this juiced up T-Rex. He has a few weak spots, he fires laser beams from his mouth, and there's mechanics where you have to hide behind pillars or jump on them to dodge his abilities. Such an epic fight, amazing spectacle and blood pumping music. Players are popping shields, healing together, resurrecting one another when they're down. The unspoken teamwork that's encouraged here was so fun to take part in. We finally down the T-Rex and man, what an awesome game, I think to myself. Can't wait to see that as a random final stage from now on. For the rest of my playtime, I only saw this event one time. Now I've sunk 10 plus hours into the game by this point, and I'm still getting a lot of matches that are just the basic payload escort. I was under the impression that each match would feel like an evolution, that as you progress through the game, your matches would increase in intensity with the more varied enemy types, the cataclysmic swarms, the 10-man raid missions. But that is absolutely not the case, and eventually I figured out why. Now, nobody seems to know exactly how this works, but from the data my friend and I collected, we found one common denominator. When we loaded up a mission, we checked to see what level the other players were, and if there were any players under level 15 or so, we knew it was payload time. I cannot say for certain, but it seems like, from our testing, that the maps, the modes, the dinosaurs, it is always determined by whoever in the match has the lowest progression through the story. So, if you load into a match and you're all above level 50 or whatever, and you've all unlocked every dinosaur, every mode, if there's just one guy in your match who's level 4 and hasn't been introduced to these things yet, then guess what? You're getting plain old raptors on the same city map, probably doing more payload escort. I don't know if this is a result of the game not matching with similar level players, or if there aren't enough players in the pool, who knows. But I kid you not, 80% of my matches were this. This is so weird to me, because the game has bots to fill lobbies sometimes, and they're not half bad either. Had the game just not put lower level players with the higher ones, instead filling those slots with bots of similar level, the experience might have been totally different. You might have actually had that constant progression. Now this represents my experience with the game, but it's hard to say whether or not yours will play out the same way. I do wonder if this will get better over time as more of the player base progresses, or if it'll just get worse as the top end who have finished the campaign slowly leave the player pool. There's no way to track these unlocks in game either. There's no info in the main menu about it, no way to track what modes and dinosaurs you currently have available to you, no real indication on when exactly you'll unlock more things. I suspect that most players played about three hours or so and were like, well, 
I guess that's it. And I don't blame them, because that progression of unlocking new dinos, new maps, new modes, etc, it's not clearly communicated at all. I will also say that these unlocks aren't very well paced either. Having to play almost 5 hours before seeing any new enemy types, about 8 hours until the first 10 man raid thing, I think that's a lot to ask of players when most of the early gameplay is so dry. It's a huge shame too, because when the stars align, Exo Primal is fun as hell. For example, this match, where during the first stage we had these massive floods of raptors pouring out in every direction, spilling over the bridge in front of us like a waterfall. We're yelling, we're laughing, we're spraying and praying while the tank lays down a bubble shield and raptors close in from all sides. It is scientifically impossible not to be having fun in these moments. I mean, look at it. To top it all off, the next stage was that payload mission. But this new map's design allowed for the enemy to try and poke at us early on. He got destroyed, obviously. Eventually, we round the corner, and the enemy payload is clearly in sight at the opposite end of the map. The entire last half of this stage was this really long tug of war, the tanks laying down cover fire while I kept up the healing, our sniper was perched up high because there was some nice high spots on this map. It was an intense showdown, and we end up taking the win. This was the perfect example of how both the PvP and PvE aspects of this game are incredibly fun when the game's maps, modes, and dinosaurs unite to facilitate them, and when the matches aren't constrained by the progression of lower level players. Now, I want to talk about boss fights briefly, because they're excellent, and I think they're worth showing off. Are they worth playing 20 hours to experience? I don't know, that's hard to say, but just skip this section if you want to totally avoid spoilers. So, we've already talked about the 10-man Neo Rex fight, but yeah, there's more. After 54 matches, we finally fight that villain I mentioned earlier, and yeah, just look at this fight. He's zipping around the arena, spawning dinosaurs. He's got a clear telegraphed attack where he fires lasers in all directions. There's a moment where he does this bullet hell style thing that you've got to dance around. There's a point where he does a massive one hit kill beam that you've got to dodge, or you can even block it with a shield. And let me tell you, nothing in this game felt more epic than holding back this blast with Roadblock. This boss has a complete move set. Like, it's not on the level of Elden Ring or something, but it's close. When we finished, I was like, what the hell was that? It was so different from every other encounter in the game, way better than it had any right to be. Then you do the final mission, and yeah, what the hell, man? I won't go into detail on the actual mechanics, but this is a multi-phase fight that combines everything you've experienced in the game up to this point. The various modes, the dinosaurs, you've got to properly coordinate with your team as there's limited revives and there's DPS checks. Mechanically, it wasn't as interesting as the previous boss, I think, but it's the first time I feel like a game has actually come close to replicating the vibe of something like a Destiny raid, and honestly, it was just a great way to end the game. Unfortunately, spectacle fights like this, the Neo Rex, the supercharged dinos, etc, they only seem to trigger at a very specific part in the story, and the only way you'll replay them is if someone in your match is up to that mission. That one player is the trigger. As far as I can tell, these cannot roll as like a random final stage during your matches. Such a massive shame that so much work went into these encounters that you will rarely ever replay. And if you're lucky enough that someone in your match has triggered it, by the way, you cannot skip any of the story cutscenes. You gotta watch them all over again, in their entirety. If you've played Final Fantasy XIV, hearing that probably triggers your Praetorium PTSD. Once again, the structure of this game ensured I would basically never see these well-designed encounters ever again, and completely soured the overall experience for me, as even after the campaign was completed, I was still often stuck playing those early game maps and modes. 
If only there was a specific mode where I could just fight the bosses, where I could flex my powered up characters and engage it- wait, wait. Savage Gauntlet mode? A PvE mode where we only fight the toughest dinosaurs with increasing difficulty and climb a leaderboard to boot? Where do I sign up? Oh, it doesn't release until July 28th. This is where we come to the monetization and the live service element. I thought I'd save this for last because I know the words about to come out of my mouth would scare most players off. So this is a full priced $60 game that has a battle pass with a free and premium tier. There are a couple skins that can only be bought with real money and there are also loot boxes. But do note you cannot purchase these at all, they're just in-game drops. There are also emblems, charms, emotes, stickers, every kind of fluff you can possibly think of. Let me tell you, when I first logged in and I saw all this, I groaned so loud you could probably hear it from Toronto, but it isn't that bad. Look, I hate battle passes, especially in full priced games, but this is a live service game and there's not a lot else here you can buy. There's no premium currency. This battle pass is actually quite generous, offering nice skins every few levels and plenty of currency in between. That said, the free track has basically nothing in it and the coolest skins are exclusive to this premium track, of course. The in-game currency is handed to you very often through just playing matches and leveling characters. This currency can be used to basically buy all of the things I listed. There is also a roadmap for future content, containing new maps, modes, some crossover events, etc. Like Monster Hunter, I believe all this content will be free, but I cannot confirm this. The real question is though, does this game have the legs to last beyond that? As I said, this is a $60 game. If it shuts down, you are unlikely to get that $60 back or the money that you spent on the battle passes or separate skins. And shut down it might. The numbers are not looking good. As I mentioned at the top, it hit a peak of 4.5 thousand players. For reference, The Cycle Frontier recently shut down, that had a peak of 46,000 players. Amazon's ill-fated Crucible had a peak of 24,000 players. Knockout City also recently shut down and that had a peak of 6,000 players, though shockingly that did stay running for over two years. Exo Primal is not Capcom's first rodeo in the live service space. That honor was given to Resident Evil Reverse, and again we all know how that turned out. However, that game is still somehow operating rating despite having a 24 hour peak of 11 players. So who really knows how long Exo Primal will be live for? What I can say though is that unlike Reverse, there's actually a solid video game beneath its shortcomings. The first few hours of this game may give the impression that it's yet another content scant live service blunder. But if you stick with the game, you'll find glimpses of a riveting PvP hero shooter with a well designed character roster. You'll find a cooperative PvE game with intense firefights against a range of diverse enemy types and engaging 10-man boss fights. When this game is firing on all cylinders, it's a damn good PvPvE game. But again, I must warn you, the game's frustrating structure will likely insist you play more rounds against the less interesting enemy types in uninspired arenas. That really soured the game for me overall, but your experience may vary as this is all up to chance. Despite their recent winning streak, Capcom's got an uphill battle here. Exo Primal is their first original IP release in the West since Dragon's Dogma in 2012. So it really needs to prove itself and build a following from the ground up if it's gonna go the distance. I'm glad Capcom took a chance here. I do believe Exo Primal has strong foundations and if they can double down on the components that make the game unique, if they can rework some of the game's systems to ensure that players have that promised escalating experience, then they may actually have a real contender in the live service space. Ultimately though, Exo Primal is not a game I can recommend for $60 but it may be worth checking out on Game Pass for those brief moments of chaotic fun while you still can.
Guys, if you've been around the channel for a while now, you'd know my good friend Steel Series. They've been supporting what we do around here, and I've always been proud to have them as a partner because they consistently put out the best stuff in each of their chosen categories. Mice, keyboards, headsets, and more. All of it industry leading and award winning. And if you don't believe me, just go check out the reviews. Recently, Steel Series and I did something pretty cool. We worked together to make a setup and unboxing video for their award winning Arctis Nova Pro wireless headset. That's now up on their official Steel Series YouTube channel. Now, when people grab one of these bad boys and want to watch a setup, video they'll have to see my ugly mug sorry about that still they should take solace in the knowledge that they've got themselves a damn fine feature-packed headset the arctis nova pro series headset comes in playstation xbox or pc variants but they also support multi-system connect allowing you to connect a pc and multiple consoles at the same time so you can just switch between them that's done through this sexy looking dedicated audio controller which not only handles that but also lets you control volume chat mix levels switch audio modes tweak eq and much more it comes in both wired and wireless variants, and if you're using the wireless version, you can hot swap batteries since the headset comes with two batteries that support up to 22 hours of playback each. I've got the wireless version. You know why? Because that version has active noise cancelling, something that almost no other gaming headset on the market has. Putting them on and hearing that sound of silence is just so good every single time. There are other bells and whistles on the SteelSeries Arctis Nova Pro wireless headset, so if you want to get the full rundown, I encourage you to check out the video I put together with SteelSeries. You'll find a link to that below, and if you want to grab one of those headsets, headsets or anything else on the Steel Series store. Don't forget you'll get a 12% discount when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout over at steelseries.com. Thanks Steel Series for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.